What's up, YouTube? Ryan Panny here. Hope you guys are doing reasonably well. I've been really looking forward to this one for a while. The legendary Faith No More are just a, a totally singular band in the world of rock and metal. So much has been written about them, and as we will discuss at length here, there's just this, there's this intersection of genuine artistic weirdness and legitimate popularity that rarely happens in music, but when it does, it's absolutely magical, and it happened with Faith No More. And Mike Patton specifically, who fronted the band from their third record onward, is quite literally one of my top five rock or metal singers of all time. The guy's fucking amazing. And the band in general, just, they tap dance around genres like few have in the world of heavy music. It's pretty incredible when you think about it. And of course, as is pretty unavoidable with their discography, I have some really strong opinions about it, about which albums are good, which albums are less good. So we should just get right into it. This is probably gonna be a long video. So here it is, my detailed guide to the Faith No More catalog. Really hope you guys enjoy this. So in last place here at number seven, I know I might already be kind of unpopular here, but the band's 2015 comeback record, Soul Invictus, is to me the perfect illustration of how fan excitement that an album exists at all and the actual quality of the music when held up to the light can be very at odds, to say the least. And frankly, who could blame anybody? Fucking 18 years in between albums for one of the most beloved and unique bands of all time. It was, it was just so exciting to have them back. A single motherfucker came out, we all tried to like it, some people did. But the actual material, though, on the album is way too pedestrian and stiff. It has none of that unpredictable elasticity that to me defines classic Faith No More. Tracks like the, the Bloated Superhero, which is one of my least favorite. You have the closing ballad From the Dead. You have Black Friday, which is really lazy mid-90s alt-rock being played 20 years after it was popular. They just feel so rigid and boxed in by relatively safe uh, and simple song structures and I guess I would say monochromatic styles. The album basically ends up like kind of a half-baked version of Album of the Year, which was their last record before the hiatus, where you have all of the straightforward approach of that record, but about half of the songwriting. I do enjoy Rise of the Fall. I enjoy Sunnyside Up. Both of those songs are kind of Angel Dust-esque. The best song in here by far is Matador, which is really surprisingly dark and theatrical and has almost like a, a black metal tinge to some of the chords that are used there. It's a really cool song. But other than that, other than basically those three tracks, every time I listen to Soul Invictus, I just get this overwhelming urge to just go listen to classic Faith No More or, or, or 90s Mr. Bumble for that matter. E either way, whichever way you slice it, that's not a great feeling to have when listening to a comeback record. So number six then has to be the band's underrated but unrefined debut, We Care A Lot, which is the band's first of only two records to feature frontman Chuck Mosley before Mike Patton would come and replace him. You know, Chuck Mosley, the poor guy, is disliked by Faith No More fans for, for the sole crime of just not being Mike Patton. Which is really unfortunate because he brought a lot of personality to that earlier material. To me, he's kind of like the Paul Deano of Faith No More. They clearly wouldn't have been as big if he stayed. The pipes aren't there compared to his successor. And they really were a different band with him, but there's still a lot of great material there. And Mosley really has this punk edge to him on this album. Really, the whole band does. When you, when you think about it, punk and hardcore were going through a real renaissance in this mid to late 80s period. And at times, the band on We Care A Lot sound like just a really sophisticated punk band, except with a lot of keys added in. The title track, of course, is a classic and one of the best songs in the band's catalog. You have snarling guitar riffs in Arabian Disco and Pills for Breakfast that are a lot of fun. In general, this album is just a lot of fun, if anything. If there's one positive adjective you can use about it, it's probably that. Although I will add the caveat that to enjoy this album, you have to be okay with a ton of just campy ass 80s keyboards just dominating these songs, which uh, frankly I understand is unique, but I'm one of those people. Ever since I saw Beverly Hills Cop when I was like eight years old, I've been infatuated with keyboards. I don't mind them in my music. More the better, throw them in, who cares? So that is kind of a unique thing where a lot of people probably would, would rank this album last. Uh, in their catalog, and I find that perfectly reasonable and logical. Uh, but for me, I really do enjoy a lot of the material on here. The rough patch that you hit on We Care A Lot is, is more towards the middle of the track list, but if you stay on the on the fringes, you're, you're in good shape. So I'd recommend listening to this album at least once because you never know what kind of contrarian love you might discover for it. Number five, I've actually already mentioned in this video, it's the final installment of that classic Mike Patton period in the 90s, 
album of the year. Band made this record and then said sayonara pretty quickly after that. And I gotta say, I think album of the year is the most hotly debated album amongst Faith No More fans. Because the band very consciously went in a much more straightforward and less eccentric direction here in terms of the songwriting. So you can see how immediately that would be super appealing to a certain subset of Faith No More fans, the, the people who probably got into them off of hearing crossover singles on the radio. But you can see how it would be a pretty big turnoff to the, the more avant-garde-minded crowd. Basically, the way all that manifests itself is Album of the Year is the only Faith No More record that sounds like it came from the 90s. All the other classic Faith No More albums from that period sound like they could have came from any decade. And, and Angel Dust in particular sounds like it comes from a decade that has never existed and will never exist ever. But you listen to Album of the Year and you're listening to a pretty quintessential 90s sounding record. That's not bad or good, it just depends on how much that might bother you or affect your listening experience. Like the track Helpless on here, which really is a fantastic ballad, it sounds like kind of soupy, mid-90s alt-rock, even with a little bit of a wink and a nod to shoegaze. The opening riff in the song Ashes to Ashes is pure Alice in Chains. So is the song Past the Glory, now that I think of it. And one of my favorite tracks on here is Last Cup of Sorrow, which is also very 90s. And like, you have those droopy vocal harmonies coupled with the meaty power chords, but the tempo is really slowed down, and then you have these droning arpeggiated guitars on top of it that just create that very bleh, the very 90s feel to it. But to be perfectly clear here, I'm mostly naming songs that I like. Like I find this to be a highly enjoyable album and I'm fascinated by the debate about it. It still to this day pretty much splits fans down the middle. My thing is that I find it to be the least compelling of that classic Mike Patton era because it's the one album that sounds like it could have maybe been written by somebody else. Like there are contemporaries of Faith No More from the mid to late 90s that could have written portions of this album. And that's just something that you never say about the best Faith No More material. The best Faith No More material could have been written by nobody else. That's the point. But still, it's an excellent songwriting here. Some of my favorite Faith No More songs are on here. And it's, most importantly, it's a fascinating Rorschach test for what kind of Faith No More fan you are, or, or will be, if you're watching this video to get into them. Introduce yourself, number four. The band's second and final record with Chuck Mosley before Mike Patton came swooping in to bring the band to new heights. But this record is super fucking underrated. My goodness. There is such a massive leap forward from We Care A Lot to this record in the short time in between records. In terms of overall musicianship, in terms of songwriting, in terms of production, which this album sounds great. I, I know that there's a reputation out there for the Chuck Mosley era to sound kind of raw in comparison with the Mike Patton era, but really all that just boils down to Chuck's actual tonal quality of his voice because the actual album sounds amazing. For bassist Billy Gould in particular on here, there's some real shining moments like the song and song with that slap bass. It's kind of one of the album's centerpieces. Also the song R&R. &R. When, when you listen to these songs, you can kind of see how people, lazy people, kind of lumped in Faith No More with, with Red Hot Chili Peppers and the whole funk metal thing. I should note that just like we care a lot, you have to love gaudy 80s keyboards to like this album. So since I do, a song like Blood, which might turn off a lot of people, is one of my favorites on here. And of course the reworked version of We Care A Lot, I prefer over the original, although both have their merits. In general, this is just a pretty overlooked album for the late 80s. Okay, now we get into the band's classic albums, of which there are three, in my opinion. I love all three of these albums so much and for such different reasons that unfortunately for any brand new Faith No More listeners who are watching this video, I actually have to recommend listening to all three if you want the full picture of this band's greatness. Usually I like to get away with distilling an artist down to one or two records, but in this case there kind of is a trio that you have to digest. We will start with The Real Thing, which was a huge smash hit and introduced most of the world to Mike Patton and influenced a, a whole generation of musicians. And it all starts with the hit single Epic. You've probably heard it. I don't think we have to even discuss how far ahead of its time Epic was. I mean, this, this song was arguably as influential to the coming new metal movement as Pantera was at the time or as Anthrax Public Enemy collaboration was. And the thing about Epic is obviously it's this overplayed single, but it really does showcase Mike Patton's wildly elastic voice. He's like a, he's like a fucking theater actor on this song where like each part of the song, he's playing a different character and going into a different inflection or tone of his voice. It's fascinating to listen to. But beyond that, my hot take on the real thing actually is that it might just be the only Faith No More album that you could actually categorize as a metal album. I know that sounds weird, but think about it. The two albums that followed this were a little bit too eclectic to just slap a metal label on. And then Album of the Year, which we already talked about, is half an alt-rock record. So the real thing 
while it might be pretty diverse sounding and pretty wide in scope and encompass a lot of different sounds, all those sounds on here are like some variation or tinge on metal. So to me, the real thing is the only Faith No More album that is a metal album. We start out with a little bit of pop metal, the fantastic opener from out of nowhere with all those big bright keyboards in there, and then of course following that is epic, and then falling to pieces, and all these tracks can kind of be grouped into the pop metal category. But then we arrive towards the middle of the record, and all of a sudden, shit gets real heavy real fast. You have those grinding triplet breakdowns in the awesome title track, which are, they're, they're made no less heavy by those atmospheric keyboards that surround them. You have the song Zombie Eaters, which has a very Metallica-esque build into these real chunky riffs. And then of course, indisputably one of the best Faith No More songs of all time, you have Surprise, You're Dead. That one song is maybe the band's most influential. Mike Patton has this super rhythmic rapid fire vocal delivery on this song that clearly foreshadows people like Disturbed's David Draymond, speaking of new metal, Corey Taylor, another one, and like every band from fucking All Shall Perish to Aborted to Revocation to I think Amana Marth, they've all covered this song. It's just monumental. And then of course on this album you also have the excellent War Pigs cover, which I didn't realize until years later from hearing it that there's actually a bonus song on this album, which to me makes the track list that much tighter if you just exclude the War Pigs Cover. But that, to me, is what's so crazy about the real thing. Despite it being such a massive commercial hit, everything I just mentioned falls under the category of metal band. This is the one album where Faith No More, for the entire record, are a metal band. Albeit a very diverse and interesting one, especially for the time period. So this album is a great place to start if you're new to the Faith No More catalog. You will instantly like a good chunk of these songs, and it is a 100% classic album. Okay, so my number two, and again, if I haven't made this sufficiently clear at this point, the difference for me between one and two here is pretty minuscule. As we go down the line here, the albums get more and more fun to talk about, but also more difficult to decipher between because they're all so fucking good. Anyway, Angel Dust, total critical darling, uh, and a notable record for just being so fucking weird and, and such a stylistic smorgasbord, yet so popular at the same time. Anybody who's honest with themselves, it, it's frankly, it, it's perplexing. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Like I said before, it's such a beautiful thing on the very rare occasion when when true eccentric and, and oddball artistry and mainstream taste just have this momentary collision. And that's what Angel Dust is. And a lot of people, probably the majority, would put this in their number one slot. Who can blame them? The one thing I do have to emphasize about Angel Dust right off the bat, it is a weird record, sure, but when you step back and actually look at it, it's kind of a logical follow-up to the real thing. Like, there's a lot of real thing residue on this album, whether it's obviously the, the amazing single Midlife Crisis, which I believe is the band's most successful song in terms of chart performance. You also have the synth tinge groove machine, A Small Victory. You have the open Atlanta Confusion, too. So th there are moments on this album that feel like the real thing just evolved a little bit further. Of course, it's the bigger departures here that, that get all the attention, the swaying Western-themed RV, the, the Midnight Cowboy cover, the, <laughs> the cheerleader-led homoerotic anthem, Be Aggressive. These are what fans think of that makes this album special. But I just want to point out that there really is a grounded aspect to it as well. There's a, a plenty of the real thing mixed into Angel Dust. It's beautifully bizarre, don't get me wrong, but people wouldn't like it if it was just weird. The songs are special too. And the lyrics. The lyrics are also really interesting on this album. It tackles a lot of topics. Obviously, homosexuality is touched on. You have White Trash America being discussed on RV. You have the, the wisdom of fortune cookies. Mike, Mike Patton uh, is also a really interesting lyricist on top of just being, obviously, from a technical perspective, one of the best vocalists of all time. All that being said, though, all the great things about Angel Dust, what's fascinating about it is it's one of those very few kind of codified classics, at least from a music critic perspective, where virtually everyone admits that there's at least one song on here that they don't enjoy. There's at least one moment where they tune out. If you say that you enjoy every second of Angel Dust, you're a liar. Because this album challenges you in a very positive way. It's a challenging, confusing record to listen to, and everyone has that moment where they kind of tune out. A lot of people have referenced RV as a song they don't enjoy. Not me, I fucking love that song. For me, I tune out, let me think. The dark and dissonant, uh, Malpractice is a pretty unpleasant song to listen to. I usually skip that one, and I usually skip Jizzlobber. But that will vary from listener to listener. It's just interesting to note that it's one of those few albums where it's like a critical classic, but it's also not perfect, and everyone acknowledges that. 
But all that aside, this is a ridiculously cool record, totally unique, not only for its time, but just for all of time. And it's one of those albums that every, and I mean every, person who is interested in rock or metal in the broadest possible sense needs to hear. I don't say that a ton. I usually aim my recommendations at certain fans, like, oh, every thrash fan needs to hear this, every doom metal fan needs to hear this. But in this case, Angel Dust is a must listen for pretty much everybody in the broader sphere of rock or metal. And my number one, the follow up to Angel Dust, King for a Day, Fool for a Lifetime. Not a lot of people's favorite record by the band. There was a lot of strife going on internally. Keyboardist Roddy Bottom in particular was barely present for the record, but goddamn, this record is fucking amazing. Now with Angel Dust, I argued that it's super eclectic yet grounded at the same time. And that's true about Angel Dust. But when we're actually talking about a record that strikes that balance to perfection, it's King for a Day. King for a Day is a record that just knocks you around quite a bit stylistically, but always reels you back in, whereas Angel Dust will kind of just leave you out there at a certain point in the record. You're just kind of out there to fend for yourself, where King for a Day is, is that exact middle ground that some Faith No More fans need. You have all kinds of fun stuff on here. You have the, the really interesting lounge influence track Evidence. You have the, the horn-driven Star AD. You have that crazy explosion of energy that is Ugly in the Morning. That's a pretty chaotic song. You, you have that one song, which in true Faith No More fashion, we haven't even touched on the band's sense of humor, but in true Faith No More fashion, I believe it translates in Portuguese to Flying Dick. <laughs> you have all that stuff. But then, at the heart of the record, is the band's sharpest and hookiest songwriting. Really, this is the middle ground between the experimentation of Angel Dust and that pure 90s vibe of Album of the Year. This just sits right in that fucking sweet spot. It's unbelievable. You have tracks like the ones I just mentioned that are a little bit more out there, but then you have right interspersed in between them. You have super hooky stuff like Dig in the Grave, you have Ricochet, you have the wonderful ballad Take This Bottle, you have the just magical closer, Just a Man, with that choir coming in, that song, oh, that song is fucking perfect in particular. You have the title track, which is also masterful. So that is what's so amazing about King for a Day. It really is the best of both worlds. Angel Dust is one world, and it's chaotic, and it's crazy, and it's adventurous, and you never know what's coming around the pike, and there's a lot of that on this record. But for those of us who also enjoy just straight up hard rock and metal songs with aggressive riffs and great hooks, we get to have our cake and eat it too with King for a Day. That's why I love this record so much. That's why it's so special for me. And just personally, if I were to sit here and just off the top of my head brainstorm, like what are my top 10 Faith No More songs, I'm willing to bet that at least half of them would come from King for a Day. So that's just the personal aspect to it as well. Anyway, you guys gotta listen to this band if you haven't yet for some reason. There will never be another band like Faith No More. There will certainly never be another vocalist like Mike Patton. Their, their, their music, I'm just feel, I feel so unbelievably privileged to have just been around in the, the general time vicinity of Faith No More coming out. And their music has just, it never fails me. It's been such a blast doing this and talking about it. I hope that it's been to somewhat of a mix of people who already love the band. And, and for you guys, I hope you enjoyed hearing me plead my case from my perspective on their catalog. But then also for people who are brand new to them and just kind of have heard this is a band they should check out, but they might have missed it for some reason or might not be exactly in their wheelhouse. I hope I've inspired you to check out some of these records because especially these last three we talked about, some of my favorite rock and metal music of all time. So as always, thank you so much for watching, guys. If you enjoyed this video and are not yet subscribed to my channel, please consider doing so by clicking right over here, as well as checking out any other rock or metal related content that I publish on this channel on a weekly basis. I really appreciate you guys watching, liking, disliking, just engaging in any fashion. Twitter, Instagram handle at Ryan Music. Again, thank you so much for watching, guys, and I will see you soon.